our series based on the story. How many of you enjoyed the opening act last week? Hopefully you did. Hopefully that you enjoy each and every one of these chapters. Of course, last week's chapter dealt with what scholars call the primal history of our world, and it covered what the story calls the entire first movement in God's upper story. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in Sunday school today. And that first movement was called the story of the garden. And this week we enter into a much longer second movement called the story of Israel. And today and next Sunday we'll be traveling through the remainder of the book of Genesis. All 50 chapters in three weeks. How's that? And of course this is going to be covering the ancestral history of Israel. In this chapter, we begin with the first calling to Abram, and we follow through to his visitations by God, promising to make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Ishmael is born to Hagar. Isaac, the child of promise, is born to Sarah. Sarai receives the new name Sarah, and Abram receives the new name Abraham. Isaac gives birth to Jacob and Esau. I probably if I was going in order should say he saw and Jacob, the twins. And from the moment of their birth, it seems that it may have been quite the wild ride for their parents. Jacob is given his name because he was born clutching at his brother's heel, the scripture says. And things don't seem to ever get much different throughout their lifetime. And as I mentioned before, the story that I'm focusing on today on my message is the story of Jacob wrestling with God in the pre-dawn hour. And the context is the hours immediately before his reunion with his brother Esau, after a long, long separation due to, as you can imagine, Jacob the second born twin trying to get into first place again. And that's narrated for us on page 21 of the story, if you want to review it. As we begin today, I want to ask, how many of you have been tagged with a nickname or called something other than your some point in your life. Yeah, probably several of us. Uh, I pity anybody who hasn't had the experience. Well, maybe not. Sometimes the label is untrue, and other times the label's deserved. I was once called a cheater by my peers in my sophomore biology class. It wasn't true. However, every exam that I got an A on was another time that I'd hear some of my classmates, some classmates behind me, say that I was cheating. Well, I was vindicated of the label when I got the only A among two biology classes on the final exam that year. And it didn't hurt that my uh, biology teacher attended the Sunday school class across the hallway from mine, as we attended, attended the same church together. I was also labeled wimp and shrimp, and as you can imagine, well, those labels stuck on a little bit longer. Labels, though, make a difference in our lives, don't they? Case in point, the story that I've shared before, maybe you've heard, I don't know, there were two brothers who were well-known around town for their crooked business dealings and underworld connections, and they were mean and cold-blooded, as you can imagine. And one day, though, one of the brothers suddenly died. And their surviving brother wanted to give his dead brother a respectful funeral. So he called the funeral home and made all the arrangements. And then he called the town's pastor and made him an offer that, as they say, he just couldn't refuse. He said, I'll give you $10,000 to put that new roof on your church that you need if, in eulogizing my brother, you say he was a saint. Well, the minister agreed. The whole town turned out for the funeral. And the minister began, the man you see in the coffin is a vile and he was a debauched individual. He was a liar, a thief, a deceiver, a manipulator, a reprobate, and a hedonist. He destroyed the fortunes, careers, and lives of countless people in this city, some of whom are here today. This man did every dirty, rotten thing you can think of. But compared to his brother here, he was a saint. <laughs> Now, saint would not probably be the first title that we would apply to Jacob after especially reading chapter 2 of the story this week and reading all of the chapters that it covers there in the book of Genesis. Jacob is still en route from Laban's home, his relative, when he receives word that
that his brother Esau is coming to meet him with an army of 400 men. He was kind of in the middle, between a rock and a hard place. And Jacob decides to hide away half of his wealth, and then with what is left, he sends all these caravans of gifts ahead to his brother, intending, if he can, to bribe his way back into his brother's good graces. And this Sunday's reading picks up the story just as Jacob sends the rest of his servants and family across the river, hoping perhaps that even if Jacob refuses the tribute, he may at least take pity on Jacob when he sees his wives and his kids. So he sends many gifts ahead of him across the river until he was left alone, and it was then that he was wrestled with. Jacob came to know his wrestler as none other than Yahweh, the Lord. Bless me, Jacob cries. And the response that comes back to him is, what is your name? Now why is that important? Well, the last time that question was asked of Jacob, it was his father Isaac. And Jacob had lied at that moment, and he said that I'm Esau so that he may steal his father's blessing that was intended for the firstborn Esau. Now Jacob's name, of course, we know means the cheat, for he is the one who came from his mother's womb, grabbing at his brother's heel. And how appropriate that name is, for all of Jacob's life he had devoted his energy to usurping what was rightfully his and trying to gain something that wasn't. Jacob at heart, he knows, is nothing more than a fraud. A charlatan, a scoundrel. <laughs> and deep down, Jacob knows this. So when the Lord pins Jacob down and demands to know his name, he is demanding no less than that Jacob confess, that he confess his ill-gotten gains and shoddy character, confess his misused talents and his wasted life. And to do this, to come clean, is for such a one as Jacob nothing less than death. For when he's revealed for who he is, what does he have left? I don't know what names or labels haunt you from time to time in your daydreams or that maybe visit you at night. What is that name that you can scarcely speak for yourself for fear or shame? Is it a name like scoundrel or cheat? like Jacob had? Or is it unworthy, irresponsible, unfaithful, addict, or alcoholic, discouraged or burnt out, divorced, deserted, or widowed, coward or bully, unloved or unloving, disappointed, disappointing, abused or abuser, ugly? There are so many names we might have going around our head today. God did indeed bless Jacob there, but he did not bless him before Jacob confessed to God his identity that was stirring in his head, that had been his identity for so, so long. And a parallel in our life is that there comes a time when we desire a blessing from God. It might be a blessing of a new job, Success in a new venture of some sort. Success in being reconciled to a brother or a sister or somebody else that we're alienated from, as it was for Jacob. And God wants to bless you and me, brothers and sisters. And He most certainly will when we are humble enough to name the truth that may be like Jacob that we have been running from for much of our lives. And God, this is the great news, God also gives us a new name just like he did to Jacob in giving him the name Israel. For when we are baptized, God gives us the name Christ. That's why, if you've ever noticed, we never use last names or surnames in baptism when we say the name and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In that sacrament, as God claims us as his own, we who have any number of names already are given the name Christian. Christ gives us his very name. And that's the blessing of coming to worship Christ in humility because we can bring in here to this place all of the names that have been plaguing us and wearing us down this week and we can come before God and we can leave them here and we can leave this place with the name Christian going forward knowing that God blesses us. 
Our true identity as children of God is simply that, and it's absolutely nothing less. Do you need that reminder today? I invite you to perhaps use, I encourage you to grab that communication form that's in your bulletin. If, if you would want to respond to God's invitation today to write on it the names that you come bearing to worship and into God's presence today, or maybe that you have struggled with in the past. And I invite you to take from here God's declaration to you that you are not defined by any of those names, any of those labels, for that is not ultimately who you are. We are God's own beloved child in Christ. And that is the only name we need to rise and to take with us in this place. Amen. As we respond to God's word in song today, we're going to turn it on.